Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello. Uh, this is a special episode of whatever this is. <laughs> <laughs> because as you know, um, on the Grumps, we uh, air the 10-minute power hour every Monday. Um, and we backstocked quite a few. And now we're, we're running low. Mm-hmm. And it seems like this is going to go on for a lot longer. So we have to film some stuff to put up in that time slot and well we were delighted to come up with the idea of doing a simple podcast yeah you know i mean people want us to keep making stuff and we want to keep making stuff and it's it's good for us to feel connected to you all by um by just coming out and and chatting for a little bit um because aaron and i you know we quarantined individually uh, for weeks and then felt comfortable getting together. But outside of our significant others, we're the only human beings that we've seen <laughs> for yep. a very long time. Yeah. I mean, aside from the people that I see six feet or more away from me as I am on a walk in a mask and sometimes goggles. <laughs> yeah. And, and aside from the people in, um, in the club that I get together with <laughs> and we all lick each other. <laughs> That's the that's the that's the challenge. Yeah. Have you seen those? The videos? Wait, the what people, challenge? The, the 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 Backstreet Boys reunion tour challenge. What are you talking about? It's people they go and they're like, Yeah, F this S and they like lick a toilet seat. Oh, so smart. Well, famously the 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 like the most popular one of this guy doing it, he ended up getting it. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it. That really flew out of left field at me. It was like, obviously it's terrible, but also like, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's just, I don't know. I, I understand people's, you know, there's there's so much fake stuff flying around all the time and misinformation. I understand people's um, impetus to think, well, this is just another lie or there's some some kind of weird conspiracy behind this. I don't think there is. Yeah. I think this is just a thing that's real and we all got to live with it for however long we got to live with it. Um, but I know that, two people who currently have tickets to the Backstreet Boys reunion tour. Yeah. I know some people that are their front row seats. Yeah. One of them's pregnant, oh, which is fun. Yeah. The absolute worst situation. Um, I mean, probably not the absolute worst situation, but it's that's, I mean, geez. What kind of life is that to be in that position? Also, for anyone who hasn't seen our Mario Galaxy episodes, um, we refer to the current situation going on in the world right now as the Backstreet Boys reunion tour 2020. That's right. Um, because there was a time at the beginning where YouTube had said, you're not allowed to say that, the the name of it. Um, who, who knows what the reason was, maybe. Maybe they just didn't want a lot of people uploading um, videos about it with the wrong information. Yeah, or, like reactionary stuff. Yeah, or they just wanted YouTube to be sort of a respite from all that stuff, you know, rather than just another place where you're inundated with information about yeah. it. But then, so we started calling it the Backstreet Boys Tour, Reunion Tour 2020. And then when that mandate got lifted, um, we really loved calling it. The Backstreet Boys <laughs> reunion tour. So that's all we're going to do from now on. <laughs> well, also, I don't know how, like, okay. It, like, they can say, like, no, it's fine now. But it's like, I don't know. I feel like it might not be fine now. Um, oh, you yeah, to, to actually call it what it is. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? I, I mean, until the moment we get a cease and desist letter from the Backstreet, the Backstreet Boys, Boys. <laughs> management. And if that does happen, I will... I will frame that letter and it will go right up on my wall <laughs> with some of my proudest accomplishments. God, I, I, I so wish that one of them knew about it. Like that they, they, and they were like, what should we do? Should we do something about this? Like, I mean, obviously not. It's like, you know, the 200,000 view video on YouTube is like nothing compared to that. I mean, they probably sell that many tickets in one arena. Yeah. So they certainly are. They're flying off the shelves in New York city. <laughs> That's for sure. But I mean, I wonder, I wonder if any of them knew about it, if they would be like, 
offended or if they just kind of be like, hey, it's funny. I don't know. Because it's, I mean, it's so negative. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't even know how much a, the Backstreet Boys are part of their lives anymore. You know, like. Well, they actually did do a reunion tour. Oh, like, my God. Semi did they really? recently. Yeah, they like wrote new music. How shit. many people died? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> the, the, I, I think it's just weird. Like, yeah, I, I guess. I guess it is that um, 20 year. 20 to 25 years seems to be the generational cycle where, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came back after that amount of time. Transformers movies started getting made after that amount of time. Ninja Turtles is always present. What, like emotionally? <laughs> no, like, no. They kept remaking. They made new cut. They would flip flop back and forth. They'd be like, you know, it was like the, the, the comic is like edgy. And then the 80s cartoon was like cute. And cartoony, yes. And then they like made an edgy one again, and then they like made a cute one again, and it, like it just they kept, they kept ma like it wasn't like super regular, but like they kept there was still Ninja Turtles out there like all the time. Yeah, you're probably right. By the way, in case you didn't notice, uh, these podcasts will not have topics, <laughs> <laughs> or at least we're not going to start with a topic. Yeah. We're, we're just going to talk about whatever, and then, um, I mean, you, we're basically just having the conversations that we always have off camera, and now we'll just have a microphone set up so y'all can be a part of it ninja turtles by the way mm -hmm. was the most successful independent comic franchise of all time yeah i remember reading about that like before eastman and laird made ridiculous bank on yeah. it. yeah before or, nickelodeon or, bought it right and one of those guys um made off a little better than the other one is that correct i mean i'm sure that's true uh there was i think there was a buyout early on but then, like, I, either of them separately, never together, but separately, come back and, like, help. Mm. Like, I think Laird was really present in, like, the IDW comics. Mm. And then Eastman was really present in, like, some of the cartoons and stuff. Wow. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think, I, I think there might be some feud there or something like that. I don't know. Over, over something so big. It's like, of course there is, right? Like, two guys that create something super successful, like. Yeah, especially something that, like. I'm sure when they came up with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they weren't <laughs> thinking like, yeah, yeah, 30 years from now, this will still be gigantic. <laughs> it, I mean. Well, also that they had no commitment to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like be because the first comic was Shredder. And th that mm. arc, it arced like it, Shredder dies at the end of like the first really? comic. Yeah. And then he's never a character again hmm. in that in that particular Universe. timeline yeah by like the third chapter or whatever they're in space with laser guns really yeah that's so funny <laughs> it goes so wild so fast yeah it, it, there i remember when i started collecting comics in the early 90s they were so popular that there were spin-off series like um adolescent radioactive black belt hamsters <laughs> that was, so that was pretty big i don't think it was a spin-off i think it was just a parody but like uh, the, even that was kind of big among my friends who would get well, past me. <coughs> excuse me. Oh, I've got it. I've got tickets. No. <laughs> um, the uh, I had an orange earlier, and it was there was a rind stuck in my throat. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God that got cleared up. <laughs> tell me more. It, well, it was a delicious orange. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I only ever so I have an orange tree on my property, and there's there's like two left. On the two tree. trees left or two no, the two oranges. Okay, got it. So I, I I picked one of them today, and I only ever eat it outside. I never take it inside and eat it. It's just something nice about like I just picked an orange and now I'm gonna eat it. Right. And, yeah. And look at grass or whatever. Um. But what the hell? What what the hey was I saying? I have no idea. I was talking about okay. Yes. Okay. Um. That was really big during those times because. There, there were like spin off. They were like rip offs. There's like biker mice from Mars. Yes. Oh, I never really thought about it. Yeah, of course that's a, that's a rip off. Yeah. Of Teenage Street Ninja Sharks. Shows. Street Sharks. That, that, those I remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they tried to make, they brought an anime over to America, and then they called it Samurai Pizza Cats. Oh. I mean, because it really, it's they're like samurai cats that own a pizza shop. Oh my god! 
It's awesome. Yeah. It's so good. And the dub is so good. You should check out Samurai Pizza Cats. It's really good. There's the ending theme is like Samurai Pizza Cats. So there's like a guy who's like, I, I hope you like the show. It was the best we could do. <laughs> <laughs> I even their obsession with pizza. It's very specific. Yeah. Yeah. Oh it, wow, I didn't even make that parallel. Yeah. That that's the pizza thing. I just remember my friend had the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles soundtrack to the movie and in between the songs like T-U-R-T-L-E Power um, and Go Ninja Go there was there would be these little skits and it would be Shredder saying and then I like he he had like that very grovelly Mr. Miyagi kind yeah. of voice and uh, and yeah and they finally said their first words and it's like Pizza. <laughs> I'm like, this is so weird. Who thought of this? Pizza? <laughs> uh, so, so how are you holding up in general, man? Just watching a lot of Ninja Turtles. Yeah, no, I mean, like, <laughs> it's weird times, and I feel, I feel okay. I feel a little disconnected from humanity mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't, Beyond the information that you need to have as as it comes out about the Backstreet Boys tour, like I don't really watch the news because there's not a lot of information to be gained there quite often. Yeah, um, it's kind of like when are we out? When are we allowed out? Yeah, just keep me posted. <laughs> I, I like I get it. I know what I have to do. Um, so when you don't watch the news, you can actually kind of convince yourself. This is sort of peaceful, you know. I'm just hanging out at my house, reading a book or something like that. Yeah. And then you turn on the news for two seconds, you're like, "Oh, nightmares!" Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, the, beyond that, I, I don't know how 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 are you dealing? Um, well, I think my situation's a little strange because, um, I've been working and we've been working. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I still am in three or four meetings a day. Uh, conference calls. Con yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you and I record like two, three times a week and, and then it's really just like the, the tough, I think I said this in a game graphs episode, but like the, the, the weirdest thing about this whole situation is just being responsible for every minute of my life. Because yes. you, usually when there's stuff going on, it's like, you know, there are people that need my attention or, you know, if I'm in the office, it's like, I'm constantly being like, Hey, I need your insight on this. Hey, we need you to figure this out. Hey. There's a call in 15 minutes, but now it's like I'm home and then every meal is my responsibility yes. and like every like part since we're home a lot more, it's like we're using things a lot more. So everything gets like all messed up and disheveled and then it's just like, oh man, I gotta like clean every day now and all, all the messes that we're making of moving stuff around. And, yeah. Um, so it's just like every, every single little mole it's like i'm tired like i just want to be like just someone do something like i just want to be here's the 10 bucks make me a, a burger king like i don't care like make please. me a burger king <laughs> yeah. build me a kingdom like i just for like the next four hours i don't have to think about food it's like i just I'll shove something in my mouth and i'm fine yeah yeah it, it, it's um i don't know if you've experienced this i've i've had kind of a strange uh moment where you know, when we were running around in our normal lives doing everything and, and you and I each for different reasons, but we, we both have three jobs in mm. a sense, you know, a and committed serious relationships at home, which, you know, n don't want to equate that to a job, but like it requires focus and attention, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so our, we're, our time is usually split um many different ways some something about this maybe it's the way the days blend into each other or the way like i can just get lost in a task for a while it almost feels like there's sometimes less hours in a day than there was when we had 80 things to do you mm. know um well because then it was it was disciplined more yeah it was like it was in a schedule and stuff like I use my calendar a lot less nowadays. Like I use it for meetings and stuff, but when it comes to like getting work done or whatever, it's sort of like, well, you know, after the meetings, I guess I'll figure that out. But like after the meetings, it's like, well, I'm gonna make food and then, you know, I'll just talk to Susie for a little bit and 
Oh, uh, listen, and then suddenly it's like 8 p.m. and it's like, oh, sh- I got, I got so much I got to do right now. <laughs> Dude, when I wake up in the morning, and, and and take a shower, um, if I just if I force myself to go about my day, then then it's okay. If I lay back down in bed after taking that shower, I might as well just write the whole day off, <laughs> <laughs> like, because by the time I even like roll out of bed and do something, it's gonna be like. 4 or 5 p.m. and the sun will be like not going down but like on its way yeah you know it, it's it's very strange how um like i i just i get it i get i get how mochi lives and i get how my dog camilla <laughs> lives like just just t- i'm gonna sit here and that's cool yeah and um not like getting attacked by predators is good enough for me today you know (laughs) yeah just being okay with i think you and i are both people that need to be like productive that need to like be useful and uh just being in a situation where where it's just kind of like you have all this all this like in between time to just kind of sit around yes but it's like that's just maddening to think about like i'm just gonna be sitting around I could be doing something right now. Yeah, I've worked on a lot of music um, in my basement, uh, which is nice. I'm very glad like I can do that remotely. Um, I obviously can't. It's not studio quality, so it's not like I can put out anything. But um, I'm writing a lot of demos, at least, and record. So when it is safe to go out and record again, I'll have stuff to um, to create. And I am, I'm actually really getting deep into Moby Dick now. Um, <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. But this is what it took. This is exactly what it took. Wow. I started that book in 2017. <laughs> and like that book, you know, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm in the 300s now. It's a 570 page book. Uh-huh. And now I'm deep into the 300s. It is phenomenal. Like yeah. it, it was, it's a real labor of love because you have to, the first hundred pages, you're almost like teaching yourself a new language because the the way Herman Melville speaks is very 18th century American mm-hmm. um, and a very learned form of 18th century American. So he's using a lot of words I've never heard in my life. Um, and the world is so different that like you have to adjust your brain to think of everything in its context, you know, like. They don't have smartphones. They don't have electricity. <laughs> they they don't have lights. That's the reason they're all wailing because the 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 whale oil lights the lamps that light the cities of the world. Wow. So yeah, it's it's crazy when when he talks about the sun going down. If you don't have whale oil, like you are in darkness. Um. So. Uh, that's why these guys were out there on these tiny ships, just risking their lives constantly. Um, but now. I'm I'm way deep into it. I the the first 400 pages of that book. Th- this is what my friend told me. The first 400 pages, he's basically teaching you, like there's plot and everything, but he's teaching you the history of whaling, you know, and and the importance of it and the dangers of it and everything like that. And then the last like 100 150 pages are, you know, the chase, Ahab versus the whale, but the by that point by the time it gets to that point you know so much about that world and you understand how high the stakes are that it's this insane you can't put it down kind of kind of book and uh i'm clearly starting to get into that point where i like i i'll just go around all day in my house and think about whaling (laughs) it's really weird (laughs) It's it's a really strange thing to have on your mind. When you get dug into something, you really see it from like that perspective of oh. um of like what you're super entrenched. Like when I got super entrenched in magic and I haven't gotten out. Yes. But like I start looking at things as like converted mana cost and like mm-hmm. like how far along into a process until you can like have built up enough resources in order to dispatch like it's it and it applies to so many weird things in life. Oh dude, it reminds me I mean, I know I told you this on a Grumps episode, 
So I'm sure some people have heard this before, but my my 24th year of life, when I was 24, um, I had I had moved to Philadelphia to be part of a band called the Northern Hughes, and we just were not popular. Um, but I was dedicating my life to it, and so in the downtime when we weren't rehearsing or playing shows or anything, I had no life basically. Um, cause I didn't, I hadn't made many friends in Philly outside of the band. Um, and I, I hated my job, so I quit. And then I was really just sitting around. And so the entire time I was 24, um, I was just getting stoned and playing Morrowind. And I did that so much. And I loved it so much. I got so into it that when you when you speak, I'm sure millions of games have this, but when you speak to someone in Morrowind, like in a town or something, there would be a percentage out of 100 of how much they liked you. So maybe they they would start out at 70% and then you'd do a task for them and give them you know, a pelt that they wanted. And then suddenly it would go from 70 to 87%. Like, <laughs> oh, they, they like me, hooray. I started, all I would do is go across the street, like when I would emerge from my crappy basement apartment on Spring Garden Street, I would go across the street to the little bodega and buy a sandwich and then come back and eat it all stony and then play more Morrowind. And uh, the guy, as I, the guy saw me so much who would sell the sandwiches, I would make him laugh. You know, we would say jokes to each other and everything. And every time I made him laugh, I would imagine that bar <laughs> above his head, like jumping up a couple digits. <laughs> and I just kept thinking to myself, I need to get a get a new hobby or, you know, th that was years before I started taking those career courses, which taught me how to budget time and how, um, how to think about uh, a larger project constantly in a mm. productive way because i can honestly say since nsp started i really haven't been bored one day in my life yeah which is amazing and wonderful uh sometimes it goes too far the other way and i'm you know stretched out way too thin mm -hmm. and and stressed but this whole Backstreet Boys tour, it I haven't run out of things to do yet because I have a lot of like side projects and right. stuff. But I could see a future where maybe all those itches have been scratched a couple months down the line, and I'm gonna feel boredom again, and that's mm -hmm. gonna be that's gonna be weird. Yeah, you know, it, especially it's because of like smartphones and stuff, like. Twitter and Instagram and YouTube they, they don't allow you to be bored yeah like in the moments where I would be bored I'm staring at a screen yes and I and I I, I try so hard at certain points in my life to excise that from it and it just it always creeps back in especially now because there's so there's so much weird downtime um, but yeah I, I haven't been afforded the opportunity of being bored at all during this whole process and even if I did when I get bored, I start projects. And when I start projects, they get ambitious. Right. And it's like, I don't, the moment that this is over and we go back to normal, there's no room for any of that. Like it right. goes back to being like total chaos again. Oh, if I don't finish Moby Dick before this tour wraps up, yeah. I'm effed. Yeah. That's going to stretch into the 2025 exactly. at least. I mean, that was, <laughs> do you remember? This is completely changing the subject. Do you remember anything from 2017 reading Moby Dick? As in, do I remember like what happens in the beginning of the book? Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm terrible about that. Yeah. Well, it's it's a strange book because it jumps all over the place. Like there's a narrative, but there will also be long stretches where he just goes off on a tangent. And then those become like little mini books in a sense oh. like there, there's one part early in the early in the book where 
know, they don't have televisions, obviously. Mm. So the way they entertain each other is to tell these stories around a fire and to go to church. And Melville is describing this preacher um, who's giving a sermon to the widows and the family members of the whalers who have died and those that are out at sea right now and haven't come back yet. And just the way he describes it is this thunderous, amazing, insane, borderline, bordering on a person losing his mind giving this sermon. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the end, he just sort of collapses against his podium and everyone just instinctively knows to get up and leave because you can't speak to him anymore. He's, he's spent, so to speak. And the description was so vivid and so interesting um, that, yeah, it completely stuck with me. Wow. Yeah. And th- there's, there's moments in that book where, I mean, I, I, and I won't lie, there's, there's moments where it's a slog, there's, where you're just, okay, let me just get through this chapter about sanding a knot out of wood on the plank of a ship, you uh, know? Oh, that sounds so awesome. Yeah, but there are other moments where I'll actually, you know, tap Ash on the shoulder and be like, can I read you this? Because this is one of the most insane combinations of words I've ever heard in my life. Um, that's just the type of book it is. So certain things... To answer your question, certain things stand out tremendously, yeah. and other things are sort of in one ear and out the other. Interesting. I, I'm, I'm like, may, maybe it's just me, or maybe it's the books I'm reading, but like, I just can't. I have to read it all the way through, like within a short period of time, or else I just lose it, and then I just, I just have to reread it. Yeah. There's this book that I've been like reading, quote unquote, for over a year now, called Places of the Heart, and I've never finished it. And it's about um, uh, psychogeography, the idea that like a space will put you in a headspace, mm. um, and so it, it. I I feel like it it, I'm like halfway through, and it doesn't feel like it's like going anywhere or making a particular point. It's just sort of like laying out these little examples, um, of like different. You know, it's like cluttered is this way and this way. And they did research on how like if you walk through city, it's like, oh, I'm happy. And then if you walk through like a city and there's like a these example of like a Whole Foods, like a Whole Foods is like huge. It's like if you're walking street side on the sidewalk next to a Whole Foods, it's all one thing for like a block. Mm. And that and it like note note notably decreases your happiness levels when you're like in a space like that. Hmm. As opposed to like all this stimuli, like new things happening every every like couple steps, um, but like that's all I remember from it. <laughs> yeah, and it's like I read yeah. half the book. Yeah, so I, it's it's like, do I read it again, or like maybe it just wasn't that interesting, or yeah, I I find myself um, doing the very old school move of when I read something that's amazing and it grabs me, I just fold over the corner of the page and then I can go back and find it. Oh, you're a dog ear. Yeah, is that I can't believe you. Is that bad? You're you're a book ruiner. You're a book butcher. I mean <laughs> sure. <laughs> At the same time, who cares? Because like <laughs> if it, it's just one of those things that people are like, you know, hoity toity about. Oh sure. Especially, I get especially it. if you're somebody that like resells books or yeah, gives yeah. them to a library or something. Well, the the thing is, I used to, I used to keep books totally pristine, and I would be very, very OCD and very careful to not open it too wide and like mess up the spine of the book and things like that. And then I would just have these really pretty books just sitting there, and I couldn't access the parts that I loved again, you know. Mm. So they became these impenetrable things that I was like, I don't want to read it again because I already read it, you know. I, that's preventing me from reading. Other books. The only books I can honestly say I would read cover to cover again are, um, well, The Last Unicorn I've read a couple of times and The Lord of the Rings books. Mm. Uh, have you ever read those? No, I haven't even seen the movies. Really? Mm-hmm. The, the, the books 
are um I mean I I, I certainly love the movies too. The books are a deep deep burn. Um I like the Actually, you know what? It's it's cool that you said that cuz I didn't really put it together. Moby Dick is having the same effect on me that Lord of the Rings books had on me where you you read it and you're just there, you know? Like you open the book and you read a paragraph and it's so descriptive and there's something about the writing style that's so transportative. It, you you're just in that world. And um It's like the beginning of Reading Rainbow, you know? Butterfly in the sky, I can fly twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading rainbow. It's a little bit like that. Whereas other books, there's some books where you just you're you're always you're thinking, but you're always aware that you're just sitting there reading words. You yeah. Know? But there are some books that you you feel like you're watching a movie. You're just you're it's and it's it takes a very skilled writer to do that. Um, but clearly, Tolkien and Herman Melville were those types of you know, once in a generation type of writers. Um, but yeah, I would, I would read those again. Also Lloyd Alexander's The Chronicles of Prydain, which um, book two of that was The Black Cauldron. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's that, the, the Disney movie, which I absolutely love, has nothing to do with the books. It's nothing like the story. The characters are the same. Mm. Um, Is there that same song that's like red, green, blue, blue, red, blue? You know, I can't honestly remember. <laughs> but it, but Taryn and the the pig and Ilanwi and Gurgi and the the Horn King. That's all. They're all in there. The Horned King. Oh, the Horned King was awesome. Damn. That was John Hurt who did that voice. Oh, poor guy. What happened to him? Why was he so hurt? <laughs> oh my god. Well, first of all, the alien burst out of his chest in the first Alien movie. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that didn't And then again good. in Spaceballs. Yeah. Oh, poor dude. And then he was um, Hellboy's scientist, old man friend. Cool. Yeah. And he was the Elephant Man. So, actually, he did a lot of hurting. His characters did a lot of hurting. Was Hellboy good? I don't remember. There's two of them. I remember. So, from what I understand, the first one was like a studio movie. And then it did well. And so they were like, Guillermo, will you do a second one? And I don't know if this was the conversation or anything, but it's like, only if I get to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And then and then Hellboy 2 is like, whoa. And it's like better, you know? Right. But I don't think it did as well. Yes. Uh, so I don't know anything about that, but that's that's always interested me. But it, it, the reason that it's like a barrier of entry is like, well, I don't want to watch the first Hellboy. Like, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch a studio movie before like comic book movies were figured out. Yeah. You know, before before like pre Thor 1, you know, mm -hmm. like it's like uh, this isn't I can tell what you're trying to do, but this got a little too like executive notesy, yeah. you know. Yeah. I'll just got to be a girlfriend and she's got to have a friend. And... <laughs> but that's not Thor. He's got to come to Earth. But well, he's from Asgard. Yeah, but he's got to go to Earth. Wow, you know what? I, I just remembered. I forgot I saw the first Thor movie. Oh, yeah, it's 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 boring. It you know, the parts in Asgard, I remember as being very cool. Dope. And then when they would come back to Earth, I would have the actual thought in my head of, "Oh." Yeah. Back on Earth. Yeah. I th I think the only cool thing about that movie is how sort of like small scale the finale is and there's the scene like in the midway point where he like finds the ha the hammer's all like contained by shield or whatever because they're like what is this and then he busts in and he tries to take it but he can't mm. and then it's like this really like somber moment it's like raining and he's like oh I'm not worthy and it's yeah. like oh that's pretty cool um but other than that it's just it's just Kat Dennings screaming for a while <laughs> she did a lot of screaming yeah I, I I was told the other Thor movies were better two. Two is more fun, mm. but I feel like it's more forgettable. But it is more fun. Mm. And then three rules. Huh. I I don't um objectively I know that the Marvel movies are great. Uh I've 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 only seen a couple. I've seen the Guardians of the Galaxy movies and um Thor and I saw the Avengers movie. Did you see Winter Soldier? I didn't. 
I, like a lot of them I've seen scenes from because they'll be on at my friend's houses a lot, you know, just on TV. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of CGI, you know? Fine. Yeah. It's like, good. <laughs> I guess. I mean, it, it's just a shame because so like so much is CGI. Then, and then you should see Winter Soldier. Really? Because that's, Practical. yeah, that's, um, I mean, a lot of people unanimously think it's the, the best Marvel movie. But it's it's like a it's like an action movie. It's hmm. like a it's like a Mission Impossible. Like it's there's stunts and there's like grounded action. Cool. And there's like really cool set pieces and like really cool sequences and stuff. And like a lot of people will be like, "Well, I don't know. I didn't, it was kind of boring." And it's like, "Okay, well, do you remember the like the elevator scene?" And then it's like, "Oh, that was that movie." And it's like, "Yes." Yeah. And it's yeah. like, "Do you remember the street scene where the Winter Soldier like the grenade launcher?" And it's like. Oh, that was dope. It's like, yeah, it was dope. Like the whole movie's fucking dope. <laughs> so it's 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 pretty baller. I love that movie. Yeah, it, it it's um I don't know. I, I don't wanna sound snobbish or anything like that. It's just hard. It it just takes me out of it a little bit. Like I, I was telling you I saw a quiet place and um I don't wanna give too much away because it is a very good movie. Um and the monsters are cool. The des- the design is cool. But I I did have the thought while I was watching it. It was like, oh, it's CGI. It's a guy in a green suit, and mm. they overlaid some stuff on top of that. Word. Um, I think if they could have found a way to make them these big scary puppets or suits, like in the original Alien and the Predator movies, yeah, I, it it would have it would have appealed more to me. Maybe not to most people because then you know they can't move as fast and and it's it's not as it would have changed the complexion of the movie but that's that's my that's the thing that prevents me from getting into the marvel movies the way that most people i think are into them i just watch them and i'm like none of this stuff is there like just uh, these people are acting against nothing and i can feel it um and it, it just there's there's something unifying about when when there's a big big old puppet there and everyone's looking at exactly the same eye line and you can tell that um they're reacting to the same thing. That's why the Mandalorian was so strong, you know. Oh, there's a lot of practical stuff in that. So much practical stuff. Baby Yoda's practical. Yeah. If Baby Yoda had been CG, I think I I don't think it would have appealed to people nearly as much. No. I, and I think there's a balance to be struck with you know the, the combination of you know the Jurassic Parks of the world, where it's like this shot's a miniature, this shot's a yeah. full scale model, this shot is CGI, um, because then the, you feel the, it less. Yeah, the the scenes where like there needs to be interaction, or like the scenes where you know it's like the T Rex eye in the in the the Jeep window or whatever, where they're looking out and they're like, Puh! and it's like that's real, and it's mm-hmm. like yeah, that feels real, um, but like when it's chasing them, that's CGI, I think, or no, 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 that's a, that's a claymation, mm. um, and it's like that feels appropriate because there's, it's like it's so wide and like it's a you know obviously you can't have a real puppet thing chasing them with that yeah, kind of animation, down trees yeah, and, yeah, uh, that makes total sense. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, I guess there's, and I guess like my eyes have just gotten more used to it because. I remember seeing the first Star Wars and the first Lord of the Rings movie, which I'm sure have by today's standards very primitive CGI, and just thinking, "Whoa, you know, it, this <laughs> looks amazing! Look at the all, oh, there's a whole army, you know." But I, I guess just too much of a good thing. Man, you gotta have we when I rewatched Mortal Kombat one and two. Oh dear, were you there for that? I was not. Oh man. CGI and Mortal Kombat 2 because they and it's so funny because the first movie was like a it was like a big budget Hollywood movie and I don't think yeah. it was like like huge budget and but they I think they were like this is Mortal Kombat it's really big right now we're going to put some money behind it. It was a big deal. Um, it came out for sure. And like for the time and even now there's some it like it looks really cool. Um and and the sequel they ended the first movie with like 
they're like, everything's happy. And then like Shao Kahn comes out of nowhere and he's like, oh, yeah, a little bit of a cliffhanger. And then they're like, let's go. And they get right. to a battle pose and it ends. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, so you have to start the sequel from that point. Right. Like, at the exact point. But half the cast was different. The budget was slashed by like three fourths. Yeah. And so, so like if you watch them one after another, it's like, all right, that first movie was like, you know, it was like kind of laughable at parts, like whatever, but it was like, it was basically Enter the Dragon, but like with a higher budget and yeah, like, fun, and like, like 1995 time. Capsule. Yeah, it's like good fights. And, um, and then the moment the second movie starts, it's just like green screen, terribly done, oh, like no. weird, superimposed, like the sky looks different and like all their hair pieces suck now. And, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what the hell is happening? Who, who were the actors that came back? Like the um, characters, do you remember? His name Robin Shu is that his name? The guy who played Luke, the guy who played Liu Kang. Okay, the main dude. Yeah, and um, the girl who played Katana came back. Mm. Uh, different Sonya. Yeah, way different Sonya. And then Johnny Cage, I think. I can't remember if Johnny Cage was the same guy, but he dies right at the beginning. Johnny they, Cage it, dies. It was one of those things where it was clear there was like con some contract dispute and they were like, we'll just kill you then. Fa whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Pe should. People don't care about this, these characters. <laughs> well, because they introduced like so many new characters in the second movie. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that second movie is just like, whoa, this is terrible. The CG. Because at the end, Liu Kang turns into a dragon mm -hmm. and then he fights Shao Kahn who turns into like a something. And, and it's just like worse than a pre-rendered like PS one cutscene. Oh no. Like it's it's laughable bad like so bad. And then there's a part, you know, halfway through the movie, Jack's they, they like find Jax or whatever and he's got like the the metal arms and he's like, Yeah man, they make me stronger and then and everyone's like, Whatever, that's a joke. And then by the end, he's fighting Kentaro, who's like this centaur creature that's huge and has like this spiked tail and, and he's fighting him with his fists and he's like oh I can't do it and he's just like oh I have to believe in myself and he like pulls he like takes the metal arms off like they're like aluminum foil mm -hmm. and then he's just like I, if I believe in myself now I have the power and then he beats him <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what that doesn't no that's absurd it's like I know what you were going for but they would clearly make you stronger. Of course. That was the whole point of them. Like, there's nothing else in the way of you being strong yeah. aside from whatever's inside you because these these metal arms are making you tremendously stronger. Oh, my God. It was it was the person I thought it was. The it, Mortal Kombat, Sonya Blade, it was uh, Bridget Wilson. She was... In the first one? Yeah. She was the love interest in Billy Madison. Oh yeah, I love her. Um, yeah, she was awesome in the she, first movie. She, yeah, I, I, I was like, why, why do I feel like I know the person who plays that? <laughs> she fights Kano. Oh, it's so good. It's funny. <laughs> Did you miss me, baby? <laughs> <laughs> I caught him from ear <laughs> to ear. <laughs> Gave him a big smile. <laughs> oh my god, I remember that. Boy, that was. Uh, that was quite a, quite a moment in history. Oh, so good. And that was also the Street Fighter movie. Have you ever seen Hackers? I, you know, I've oh, I've seen some scenes from Hackers. Yeah. But, very but, young. But not the whole movie. Very young Angelina Jolie. Very young Matthew Lillard. Um, Matthew Lillard. Yeah, he's got like the, the pony, like the pigtail braids. Doesn't he, doesn't he, isn't he like, ha <laughs> ha? Like in that movie, like he's weird in that movie. Yeah, he's kind of yeah. I I can't remember details, but I remember watching it even at the time and thinking, this is going to look very dated in five years. <laughs> like it's it's just exactly 1995. It was dated then. Yeah, it's true. It's, just, it's like what this isn't how computers work. Ugh, it's got that um that song that I loved, uh, Halcyon and on and on by Orbital. Oh, is dope. that Orbital? I can just hear it just by the name of the voice or the name of the the artist, the name of the song, and the era it's from. Yeah, like I, <laughs> yeah. that is such a like that moment in time. It's got a repetitive loop 
of a very a girl singing like a very breathy. Oh, of course. Yeah, it's, it's very sampled. Yeah, it's really pretty though. It probably has like the that like I think it's that, like, bum, bum, that, that synth. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> yeah, something something to that effect. Uh, but gosh, I might I might throw that on Spotify. Give myself a little a little nostalgia bump. Oh snap! You're not going to support the artist by buying it on Apple Music. I'm supporting them by listening to on a Spotify. Yeah, but you get like a cent for that. Uh, trust me, I know. Yeah, I get the ASCAP checks for Starbomb. <laughs> They're like fifty cents. <laughs> Starbomb has like millions of listens on Spotify. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's um, that's uh, that's 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 a pretty good podcast, right? Did we do? Did we do it? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Uh, let's let's just put this out there into the world and see if people like it or if everyone says that's stupid. Don't do that again. Well, I mean, this is what it's gonna have to be for a couple weeks. Yeah, I just, wish it wasn't just, the just case because that's the that's the way the world turns, unfortunately. Unless you want to see just the worst quality, constantly messing up video feed. I mean, we filmed the ending of a Power Hour. Where I, it was just my my Canon M50s. Susie has one, and I have one, so I use both of them. And like it, the battery died after like six minutes. Yeah, and and it just looks terrible because I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. I don't have lights in this house, like in terms of like filming lights, because I brought them all to the office. Mm-hmm. So I really don't want to do that because it'll good. look terrible. <laughs> it just won't be a good situation. But we've got the whole sitting in front of Mike's thing down pat from mm-hmm. eight years of Game Grumps. So I feel like that'll be a better quality thing to put out for people in yeah. the meantime. Yeah. We, we, we just want to we just wanna stay in your lives and you be in our lives. Because this thing, this thing is a drag. When it when it pulls people apart, you know, Susie said something very astute, and it it really stuck with me. Um, she said, "I think people now are at past the point where there's the shock of it going on, and everyone is reaching out to each other, like, are you okay? Are you okay?' Um, and you would hear from a bunch of people you hadn't heard from in yeah. a while. Like now, now it's it's to that point where it's settled in a little bit." And that makes it a lonelier experience, in in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so she said that, and I was like, man, that really clicks for me. So I'm going to go text a bunch of people I haven't spoken to in a while. Yeah, I've been trying to do that a lot more. I've been trying to just get on the phone with people. Just like, I'm playing a video game. Do you want to chat? It's like old times, just before all this. In the long, long ago. Yeah, sitting in my bedroom on Skype. Before time. Playing Fallout. I mean, now this, it's so, like, Discord, Discord has an option where you can you can play a video game on your computer and then just stream it to your friends. Yeah, yeah. And then just over voice chat, just talk. And it's like, I, just the other day, it was, Allie was teaching me The Sims. Oh, cool. And so she was just playing The Sims and then streaming it, and I had it up on the, the TV in the living room, and we were just talking with her while she was doing it. It seems so much healthier, man. It seems like such a healthier way to communicate than than Twitter and and Reddit and Oh yeah, directly talking to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and just so much less negativity from strangers and um I mean, I got a I got away f- I was never on Twitter, but I I got away from everything social media uh except for Instagram because that one's like a not it's not a very interactive one, you know, it's just something I can put stuff out there and then kind of walk away from. Mm. So it's not five hours later and I'm thinking, what happened to my day? You know, (laughs) but it, it, um, I don't know. It's that, that seems a lot healthier. Just so if, if you're home, you know, and you're feeling lonely, don't, don't be afraid. Just reach out to someone you haven't spoken to in a while. There you go. What's the worst that happens? They, they don't pick up or, whatever here imagine this scenario right imagine this scenario for yourself some person that you haven't heard from in a while randomly calls you out of the blue and wants to talk to you because they miss you would that make you feel good 
then imagine that the person that you want to call being in that situation. Oh my God, you totally flipped the script. That's right. <laughs> I just solved anxiety. Wow. <laughs> it Hopefully people watch or listen until the 50th minute of the podcast. <laughs> Otherwise, their anxiety won't be cured. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, but in any case, thanks so much for listening and uh, thanks so much for being fans in general because goodness gracious, the, the the lives that you've afforded us and uh, the careers that you've given us really, really sustain us through the the stranger moments in life of which this Backstreet Boys tour certainly is one. Mm. And uh, so thank you from the bottom of our hearts and uh, we'll keep doing whatever we can to uh, entertain you. Hell yeah. Yeah. Lots of love, everybody. Love y'all. Bye.